Amen. Take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to 1 John chapter number 5. 1 John chapter 5, we have been on a journey through 1 John since last October. So many of you returning students, you were a part of that uh, study every Sunday, verse by verse, through this epistle called 1 John. And we've come to the final two verses this morning. And I like to call those verses to your attention. We'll begin by looking at verse number 20 of 1 John chapter 5. The Word of God says, And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, as we come with open Bibles, I pray we likewise would come with open hearts. I pray, dear Lord, for the filling of your Holy Spirit this morning to be real in my life and as well as those who listen. We ask, dear Lord, that you would win victories today, which you have promised in your word, even in this letter, that we can overcome the world and we can overcome Satan and sin through the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would speak to hearts in a very specific and personal way today as I preach your word. I cannot do it within myself, Lord. I yield myself to you and pray that you would help me. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. As many of you know and have learned during this study, the disciple John was the youngest of the 12 disciples which lived and served with Jesus Christ for the three years of his public ministry. During those three years, he along with his brother James and Simon Peter were part of the Lord's inner circle. And they were part of that three that at times the Lord Jesus would, would call apart uh, by himself. John, being the youngest of the disciples, ended up living the longest along the way. And he also was given a few titles during that time of his years, which were expanded, extended over 90 years of life. One of those titles that described his nature and described uh, his character was the title that the Lord Jesus Christ gave him, the Sons of Thunder along with his brother, James. Have any of you ever been given a nickname before? Most of us have. Sometimes we like those nicknames. Sometimes we don't. We have a, one of our deacons. His nickname is Dumplin'. And every time I hear that, I get hungry for chicken and dumplings. But Jesus gave James and John this nickname of the Sons of Thunder because of their, their zeal and their fervor for him as young men. One of the other titles John has been come to be known by is the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he actually gave himself that title as he was writing the Gospel of John. He did not want to refer to himself in the first person. And so he used that title which describes the close communion that John shared with Jesus Christ. A later title that was given to John after God used him to write five books in the New Testament is the title of the Apostle of Certainty, which is clearly evidenced by his repeated use in this letter of the word no, which he uses somewhere around 35 to 40 times in this letter called 1 John, a letter that was written to believers, and we saw three or two we knows last week, we're going to see another we know this week, and you'll notice there that in three out of the last four verses, those verses begin with the words, we know, we know. Since John lived 60 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ to nearly the end of the first century, he witnessed some of the attacks against the character of Christ and the early church, which Christ began with his 
disciples and is still building today the church that we are a part of. One such attack was led by false teachers known as Gnostics or Gnosticism, and that word actually means knowledge, uh, kind of an elevated or they claim to have a superior knowledge than some of the early disciples and Christians. And it's very interesting that John uses the word know 35 to 40 times in correcting their false doctrine. But one of, the, one of the attacks by the false teachers who had perverted the truth was about the complete humanity and full divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So from the very outset of this letter until the very end of this letter, John keeps coming back to the foundational truths of who Jesus was and who he still is today. Keep in mind, since John had personally heard Jesus teach with his own ears, he had personally seen Jesus perform miracles with his own eyes, and he had touched Jesus with his own hands. He could write with confidence in response to these false teachers with clarity, confidence, and assurance who Jesus Christ was. And you'll notice he comes to the end of verse 20, and in reference to Jesus Christ, he says, This is the true God and eternal life. Now I want you to notice with me, before he gets to that last statement, the essential and foundational truths about Jesus that John wrote about with certainty and urgency that we need to know for ourselves today and in the days to come. Because the false teachers have not gone away. There's more now than there were then. The attacks against Christ's character have not stopped, nor will they stop. And so we as believers need to know these foundational truths about the character of Jesus Christ, the true God, as John calls him here. Notice with me, first of all, this one that he calls the true God concerns his incarnation, his incarnation. Notice there, it says, And we know the Son of God is or has come. So he writes here with confidence and assurance, once again, we know. Now, he uses two different words for no in this letter. This is the word for no regarding an intellectual knowledge, an intellectual cognitive knowledge. And you'll notice here, he says, we know, and then he uses that definite article of the, we know the Son of God. And what's important about that is he's not saying, we know a Son of God. We know one of many sons of God. He says, we know the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, which he introduced Nicodemus to in that great verse, John 3, 16. And so he makes it clear, this is the Son of God. That phrase, Son of God, that title, we've talked about it before, but let me remind you, it is also saying God the Son, co-equal with the Father, co-eternal, 100% man when he was on this earth, and 100% God. You'll notice here it says he has come. This coming is speaking of his incarnation, which we read about in John chapter number 1. It's simply talking about when he left heaven, and took upon him flesh, a human body. And the Bible says in Philippians 2, he was made in the likeness of men, and he humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. God in the flesh. Why did he do that for us? To die for our sins? to take our place, to be our substitute. He became the Lamb of God 
which taketh away the sins of the world. I'm so glad he did that for me. And I'm glad to tell you he did that for you as well. Now keep in mind, the Apostle John witnessed his sinless life. You live with somebody for three years, you're going to figure out what their weaknesses are, aren't you? Some of you that have new doormates, you've been with them maybe for a few days right now. But you better buckle your seatbelt because you're going to find out everything about them and some of it you won't like. But that's just the way it is. All of us are sinners except Christ. John witnessed that for three years. John was at the cross. I believe the only disciple that was at the cross beside Mary, the mother, earthly mother of Jesus. John was the first of the 12 disciples to the empty tomb. Now the ladies were there first, but John is the first one that actually looked down into the tomb. Simon Peter went in first, but John was the first one there. And then he saw Jesus later that day. That's why he could say, we know. We know the Son of God has come. And he's making it clear here that he was not a ghost. He was not a spirit. And some of the false teachers were teaching that the uh, Spirit of God came upon Jesus, the man, when he was baptized, but that it left him, that God's Spirit left him when he was on the cross. And John is making it very clear here that the Son of God has come. And that word come is present tense. He not only has come, but he is still here. And he is still with us today. He is living and he has come. There's no doubt about his incarnation. There's no doubt about the earthly revelation of Jesus Christ. John says, we know, we know he has come. Now notice the second foundational truth that he mentions here. The second thing he says is this one who has come and is still with us has given us understanding. A couple of things there it's important to know. First of all, he uses the word us. He's talking to believers. He's talking there in the third person, but he's talking about those, as we've studied throughout this, this letter, those who have been born of God. Those that have come to, to God in repentance and faith and have put their trust in Jesus as the Son of God. Not just any Jesus. Not just somebody's made-up Jesus. And as people say today, this is my truth. No, John is saying he is the Son of God. 100% man, 100% God, and those that have been born of him. That's who he's writing to here. And he says here he has given us understanding. In other words, he is talking about a, a spiritual perception and enlightenment to the minds to those who know him. And this, this phrase or this word understanding literally means through the mind. It's used 12 times in the New Testament. And it's talking about reasoning which leads to perception. It is the ability uh, to understand the meaning of Christ coming and to know him. Not just intellectually but to know Him relationally, to know Him experimentally, and to know Him personally. In other words, not just a head knowledge and facts about Jesus Christ, but a true understanding that goes from our minds to our hearts. Don't miss the purpose of this enlightenment in verse 20. It is that we may know Him who is true, that we may know him who is true. I love that word true. That's a rich word. It's a word that literally means authentic, real, and genuine. When I, when I saw this definition and the word real, my mind went back to uh, a time in my youth when I guess Coke and Pepsi were, were having, uh, having a battle and they were fighting it out. And Coke came out with the, the slogan, the real thing. How many of you remember that? 
Yeah, the real thing. Coca-Cola. Well, I'll let you decide which one is better. But I'm here to tell you, she said Pepsi. We're going to have a church split right here in the middle of the sermon. I better move on, hadn't I? I better move on. Some of you think Mountain Dew is better than both of those. <laughs> All of them are bad for you. Yeah, you're right about that, Roger. We better just leave it right there. Each of these meanings, real, authentic, and genuine, they are in reference to Jesus Christ. John is making it very clear. He is the true God. In the context, it is given, of course, in contrast, as I mentioned earlier, to the false Jesuses that the false teachers had attempted to deceive the believers of that day with and had caused some of them to doubt. So John was writing to them and saying, you can believe what we have told you about Jesus Christ. We have told you the truth about him. And you do not need to doubt. John knew for sure. And he had the number, as we would say, of these false teachers because he had known Jesus personally. He had known Jesus relationally. He had known Jesus experientially. He knew him. He had seen him live and love. He had seen him teach, heard him teach and heard him preach. He had seen him die as an innocent man and rise as a resurrected Lord and then ascend into heaven in that exalted position where he is today. He had been given understanding of the true God and so have believers today. He wrote there that he has given us this understanding. And though not everybody understands that, and not everybody you meet or that you may be in the dorm with or that you may be in class with uh, this year has that understanding, if you have that understanding and you have come to know Jesus Christ personally and relationally through the truth of God's Word, don't allow somebody to talk you out of that. Don't allow somebody to, to make you doubt what you know you have believed and the one that you have received. And I'd just like to stop a moment and park right here and offer a word of warning to all of our students, whether you are a, a high school student, a, a new undergrad at Tech, or maybe you are a, a graduate student. All of you are going to be sitting in classrooms and listening to teachers and professors speak and to, to lecture. Many of those uh, professors and teachers are experts in their fields of study and are worthy of listening to in their field of study. And I urge you to listen well, to complete your assignments, to study for every quiz and every test and every exam in a way that will glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. I urge you to show respect for your teachers and to your professors as they teach you about mathematics and engineering and history and business and speech and computer science and, and so forth. But if they attempt to try to teach you something different about the Lord Jesus Christ than what is revealed in the Word of God, you need to be quick to recognize the, the, the fact that Satan has always tried to cause doubts and sow seeds of deceit. And he tries to package those doubts and deceits in fancy phrases and false theories of men. And they attempt to pass them off as the truth. It started in the first century. And it's going strong today. And some of you may be sitting under or have already sat under someone that is supposed to be teaching you how to be an engineer and they've decided they're going to enter the field of philosophy and religion. Well, let me tell you something, students. Stay with the Word of God. Stay with those who witnessed who Christ was and gave those accounts and God has preserved those accounts. Apostles like, like Peter and John. We have those accounts in the Word of God. These men and women are not experts about Christ, but they, some of them are experts of creating doubt 
and confusion in the minds of young people. And may God judge them for that if they are doing that on purpose. And may you be wise enough, may you be knowledgeable enough of what the Word of God teaches about the Lord Jesus Christ to know error when you hear it. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen. So He wants us to live in a close, growing relationship with Him, and that's why He gives us this understanding. And He does that for those that have believed. Just a couple of verses, very quickly, I want you to see these. If you'll turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I would encourage you, if you uh, mark your Bible, to mark these verses because you may need them somewhere along the way this semester. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, and he's dealing here with, uh, with those that are, are lost and those that, are, that uh, do not know the Lord. And you'll notice with me here in verse number 12 of 1 Corinthians 2, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now notice verse 14. But the natural man, that's talking about the person that has not been born again. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Once again, he's writing there to believers. So if you have a teacher that stands up and says that this Bible and, and Jesus Christ is a bunch of foolishness, that may be the way he sees it. And it probably is. But you don't have to go that way. You don't have to buy that just because he's getting paid a bunch of money to, to, to act real smart or actually is smart. I'll, I'll not deny him of that. But sometimes they step out of their realm when it comes to spiritual things, don't they? And so we need to be wise. One other portion of scripture on your way back to 1 John. Stop off at Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. And I want you to see these words of warning that we find here in the book of Colossians chapter 2 beginning in verse number 1. For he said, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance. Notice this, full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Now notice this phrase in verse 3 regarding Christ. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Notice verse 7. Rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now that's very clear, isn't it? That men will try to deceive. We need to be grounded, rooted, built up in the steadfastness of our faith. I'm thankful to look out here today and know many of you students and many of you grad students and many of you adults and teachers and you give that testimony that you are grounded in your faith. And may all of us continue on that pursuit. Let's go back now to 1 John and we'll look at the third essential truth here and that is his union 
with his children. Notice it continues there in verse 20. We are in him. That is true. He uses that word again. Even in his son, Jesus Christ. What a wonderful truth and what a wonderful phrase. He uses two times in this, this one uh, little section here. And that is the phrase, in him. Those who were once separated and outside of Christ because of sin have been brought near and literally into Christ through faith in the gospel. The scripture teaches us elsewhere that when we believe and when we are saved, that the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Christ and we become members of his body. Are you part of that group? Are you one of these who can say, we who are in him, those who have believed upon Christ and trusted in him for salvation? We are in him and he is in us. We abide in Him, the Bible tells us, and He abides in us. We have been brought into this vital union with Him, just like John taught about in John 15, in the, in the scripture there about the, the vine and the branches. And as you see from the illustration, the fruit that comes from those branches. But that only happens when the branches stay connected to the vine. Because it's through the vine that that life-giving sap flows. And dear friend, it is through the life of Christ that we will have the power to become like Him and to lead others to Him and for fruit to come forth out of our lives. We are in Him who is true. The real one, the authentic one, the real Savior the genuine Son of God. As John wrote in John 1, the true light, the true bread. And as he wrote in John 15, he said, I am the true vine. So many people try to find satisfaction and life by being with a certain group of friends. Maybe they try to find it through a relationship with a certain individual. They think that if they can just be part of a certain income class and after they, they finish school and start their career, if they can just get this job for this amount of money, then they will be satisfied and they will be fulfilled. Some continue to look in educational uh, statuses and, and, and institutions and thinking, if I could just get this one more degree and I could get these words before my name, then I would really feel like I'm somebody and I've done something. I would be happy. And then others look forward in social status. And if they will get enough likes on their, their social media page and if they will get enough people following them, then they will be happy. I'm here to tell you, those things will not satisfy long term. There is one who will never leave you or forsake you. There is one who will always stay with you through the bad times and the good times, through the sunny days and the cloudy days. And he is the true one. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't look for or settle for substitutes. In 1 John 1, 4, he wrote, and these things, talking about this letter, I write unto you that your joy may be full. He does want to give you a life that is real, a life that does satisfy, and a life that is authentic. And that brings us now to the fourth foundational truth that we see here, and that's where we'll close today and make the application, and that is concerning his deity. We see this in our title of the sermon and in the last, last sentence of verse number 20. Notice with me there where he said, this is the true God, speaking of Christ, and eternal life. This is one of the strongest statements of his deity and his divinity in the New Testament. It was certainly necessary because of the assault on both his humanity and his deity in the first century. And what we see the Apostle John doing here is standing up and fighting for the doctrinal purity of the gospel. And I'm glad he did. I'm glad he did. What we see him doing here is uh, he is not ending this letter with a footnote, but he's ending it with fire. 
and he's on the front line. And up to the very end of this letter, uh, he, he is standing up for the purity of Jesus Christ and the gospel. And we need to do the same thing today as believers. He is not finishing here with a fading thought or fancy words, but with a real fight for the truth. And he's making it very clear that Jesus Christ is not some abstract idea. Jesus Christ is more than some moral example or great religious teacher. Jesus Christ was not just some picture of, of God. He is the true, the real, the authentic God. And he adds to that, you'll notice there, the source of eternal life. We studied about this phrase, eternal life, and it's talking about the life of God within us now and in the ages to come. So when we receive eternal life from Jesus Christ, it doesn't just start after we die. It starts right now. And we have that life within us. It's a new life. It's a supernatural life. It is called abundant life. It is an overflowing life over and beyond what this earthly life can give to us. If you want to know how to have eternal life, Look with me at verse number 11 and down through verse number 13 and it can't be any clearer and I can't say it any clearer than what God's word says. Verse 11 says, and this is the record or the witness that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. He that has the son has life and he that has not the son of God has not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Do you know you have eternal life? You say, well, nobody can know that. Yes, you can. It's depending on what you've put your faith in. If you're trusting yourself for it, or if you're tr trusting some kind of religious rules that you're trying to keep, I could see why you would doubt. But if you're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and who is the true God, you can have assurance. Because your faith is in one who always has been and always will be. And your faith is in the one who paid for your sins and rose again. As we look at these things today, and as we've looked at them, His incarnation, His enlightenment, his union with us and his deity, we can have the assurance he is the true God and eternal life as John declared him to be. You may have noticed that all of these, you probably haven't unless you're an English teacher, but all of these are what you call indicative statements. And I didn't know that off the top of my head. I read that this week. These are all indicative statements, which is a statement of the truth and is given before a command is given, which of course is an imperative statement. And you'll notice with me here, this may help you understand verse 21 for the first time, why it is where it is. All of these statements about Christ come before verse 21, which is the main application. Little children, keep or guard yourselves from idols. Verse 21 is not just a random thought, but it is an application. So many times when I've read that verse, I've thought, well, why did John just put that in there at the end? Well, he had a reason. He just talked about the true God. He just lifted up Christ. And as he was in Ephesus, he probably saw all of the idol worship going on around him. And he saw these believers being deceived. And he said, little children, a loving term, not a demeaning term. He said, little children, guard yourselves from idols. Don't allow anyone, anything to steal your affection for Jesus Christ. In light of the truth about Jesus that we see here in verse 20, don't be led away by false idols. Don't be led away by fraudulent teachers that will try to steal your adoration and your affection from him. 
guard your heart because he and he alone is worthy of our deepest love and our most devoted worship. No career, no possession, no hobby, no person should be treasured above him. And may we join him in saying the last word together, which is, Amen, which means, may it be so. Would you bow with me in prayer as we take time to examine our hearts in regards to the word of God that we've heard today?